very oh, good evening. Let's <laughs> start with that. Good evening. Welcome to our Thursday night class. Glad that you uh, braved the weather and the elements that we have tonight. Our first snowstorm of the year. So uh, thank you for being here tonight and for those online as well. And uh, we continue on in uh, Proverbs chapter 22. We're going to get into verse uh, 15 this evening. And we've got one more verse where we finish up what's called Collection 2 of the book of Proverbs, which has been a main section from chapter 10 all the way to chapter 22, halfway through it. Uh, and then we'll finish up chapter 22 uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks with a few more topics, and then we'll get into the book of Luke. So uh, early December, we're going to start the book of Luke, and we'll get right into that. So uh, I just did a quick uh, an timing and analogy, and everything seems to be working out for the having the birth of Jesus announcement be around Christmas time when we get into the book of Luke. So it uh, should, should work out great according to the Holy Spirit. But in any case, we've got a couple more things to note here in Proverbs, and we'll get right into that. Uh, reminding you that there is a, a, a food drive collection that we're having. If you'd like to bring canned goods for people, uh, the homeless and uh, those in need in our local area, bring those uh, Sunday morning with you, and we'll uh, collect those and then bring them Monday morning to deliver them for people for Thanksgiving. And then we'll probably continue that into the Christmas season as well. Uh, continue to pray for uh, certainly uh, Mary Ellen and her travels and uh, give thanks for Terry and uh, her safe return and her, her travels as well. She's back safely from her trip. So uh, thank God for those things. And all the other uh, prayer requests that we've had over the last uh, couple of nights as well, uh, keep all those folks in prayers. Uh, pray for Brad's family. His, uh, one of his uncles passed away. Uh, last night, so uh, he's 94 years old, uh, so uh, keep uh, the family in prayer in the coming days if you could, and uh, was that, was his, what was his name again, Bus, Bus, yeah. Homer, oh, they called him Bus, okay, Homer, but called him Bus, okay, all right, so uh, keep Uncle Bus, not Uncle Buck, but Uncle Bus in prayer, okay, uh, well, he's home with the Lord now, so we'll give thanks for that, but um, uh, pray for his family as well. All right, any other things this evening? All right, then let's get into it. Oh, we begin as we normally do with a moment of silent prayer, giving us the opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1 9 to ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Again, who fills the cleansed vessel, or when we have a cleansed vessel, that means we're filled with the Holy Spirit because we're not filled with sin any longer. We've been cleansed from all unrighteousness, the known and unknown sins, and therefore we have the Spirit working within us. He is our true teacher and our true mentor. So if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <clears throat> and Heavenly Father, we come before you this day in humility and worship and in praise of you and your son Jesus Christ and Father we just thank you for all that you have done for us providing for our every need providing all of our spiritual blessings and also the physical blessings that we need to walk in your plan each and every day we ask that you continue to provide those things so that we glorify you as being royal priests and royal ambassadors unto you and Father we thank you for our church and our local assembly where we can freely come and learn and understand your word and also serve and we ask that you lead us to Concentrate and focus on the word that you have for us this evening, not being distracted by the details of life, but instead focused on our relationship with you and the word that you have for us so that our souls are edified and you are glorified. Father, we pray for Brad's uncle's family this evening, uh, Uncle Bus, who uh, passed away last night. We thank you for another victory in your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for bringing him home to eternal glory. We also pray for his family in the coming days and in the loss that they have in the mourning and the funeral process. And we ask that your word be mightily uh, in the lives of each individual and also being preached during the memorial services. So Father, we thank you again for his life and also for bringing him home. And Father, we also pray for our nation. We ask that you watch over, protect, and guide it, being with our president and his family, leading him in all his decision-making authority, being with our firemen, our policemen, our, our, uh, th our military, men and women who are standing on guard on our behalf, we ask that you protect and guide each and every one of them, and we thank you, Father, for this service and for their sacrifice. Also this evening, we pray for one of Brad's uh, co-workers and their family as well, who was uh, shot and killed down in uh, the recovery process down in Puerto Rico, or the Virgin Islands, I should say. 
uh, and uh, we ask that you be with his family and the loss that they suffered uh, in that tragic death last night, and we ask that you bring them healing and comfort as well. So, Father, we thank you again for this time that you've given to us. We ask that you lead us now to praise you and worship you through song, and then in concentration of your word, in Christ's precious name, amen. <coughs> All right, if you could all rise for our doxology, please. <clears throat> all right, you please follow after me. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, his Son, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his Son. We give thanks. We give thanks. All right, thank you, and uh, please be seated. <coughs> All right, let's turn our Bibles now. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 22, Proverbs 22. We find ourselves in verse 19. And once again, as we've seen in the last half of the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 22, we've seen these individual lessons that have already been taught throughout the book of Proverbs, but now given to us here in the overall context of what's going on. Remember, the context is uh, the rich versus the poor, that we are all one in Christ, and we should not have unequal treatment for one group versus the other, the rich, the powerful, or the weak, and the poor, as they are considered. We ought to treat them all as one because we all have one maker, as it says back in the first few verses. We have one maker being our God. Therefore, we should have equity, fairness, righteousness, and justice inside of our society, especially in the legal sense, in the legal, uh, the legal parameters, again, inside the courtroom, in our politics, and any other aspects of uh, civilian government and uh, civility. We should always have equal tri uh, tribute, equal opportunity, equal privilege, and then we should have equal justice and righteous operating and functioning. Now, as we've seen, as I said, in the second half of this chapter, various verses that we can take as context in a broader spectrum about avoiding sin in general, but here we are narrowing it down to the specific topic and context of what we're seeing. Fairness inside the courtroom, treating the rich and the poor equally, equitably, and fairly each and every day. So what we're talking about here in verse 15 is the discipline or training of a child or an immature believer, as we would also say, so that they understand not to be operating in sin and have sins of the tongue where they are lying inside the courtroom or cheating in some form or fashion or taking a bribe, as we talked about on Tuesday night, but instead they're operating in fairness, righteousness, and integrity. So let's look at Ephesians, uh, excuse me, uh, the book of Proverbs, chapter 22. Now we find ourselves in verse 15. In verse 15, well, let's go back to verse 10 because this gives us all that context of the individual precepts that talk about the courtroom scene. It says, drive out the scoffer and contention will go out. Even strife and dishonor will, will cease. He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious, the king is his friend. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, but he overthrows the words of the treacherous man. The sluggard says, there is a lion outside. I shall not, or I shall be slain in the streets. And remember, that's making excuses as to why not to serve or show up at court and tell the truth. In verse 14, the mouth of the adulteress is a deep pit. He who is cursed of the Lord will fall into it. And there we talked about the flattering words of the adulteress, the bribes that could come to us, the extortion that could come, uh, the uh, slander, the maligning and gossiping that could force us into telling a lie in the courtroom rather than speaking the truth. And as it says, he who is cursed of the Lord will fall into it. Remember that curse talked about really 
doing it unto yourself. Again, God's divine discipline in the form of self-induced misery when we fall into sin. God allows us to operate in sin because he gives us free will choice. And when we operate in that sin, there are consequences that come with it. And that ultimately is the deep pit and problems that we will have as a result of lying or cheating or stealing or taking a bribe inside the courtroom, inside the legal system, or in any aspect of life where we operate in sin. Now we get into verse 15, which brings us back to getting rid of the folly, getting rid of the sin and evil within our lives. And it says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. And then in verse 16, we'll wrap that up on Sunday morning. It says, He who oppresses the poor to make much for himself or who gives to the rich will only come to poverty. So again, in verse 16, which I'll talk about on Sunday in more detail, once again brings us back into the courtroom scene, utilizing language of extortion in that passage. So we'll see that as we wrap up this chapter in the context of, or actually this collection, and the first half of chapter 22. But tonight we're talking about driving out folly and foolishness from those who are operating in sin. Let me remind you, because we saw this word quite often in the early chapters of the book of Proverbs, and actually it's used in just about every chapter. There's maybe about five chapters of the whole book of Proverbs that don't use this word. But foolishness is that word, and it's a welleth, and e- even the W could pronounce as a V, a veleth. And it comes from the root word evel, or we would say evil. In the Hebrew, where we get our English word evil from is the Hebrew evel, which is basically the word for fool, folly, and foolishness. This is a cognate, a little bit expanded, and it does mean folly, it does mean foolishness. Here we have a noun in regard to this individual, so foolishness is a thing. You know, nouns, person, places, or thing. This is a thing. It's a characteristic. It's a mode of operation. It's a way of life. And that's what's being described here in this word foolishness. It's the complete genre or result of the life of this individual. It emanates from the mentality of his soul that starts with foolish thoughts that then results in foolish behavior. And we look at the whole thing and we call it what? Foolishness, both of the mind and of the words and of the body that acts in sin. So here it's the concept of various kinds of moral degeneracy. It's talking about sin, evil, and human good. We know the context, as I've already explained tonight, and have we seen over the last couple of sessions together. We're talking the context of the courtroom and having fair, equitable trials, allowing the the poor and the weak to have the same ability as the rich and the wealthy within the legal system to present a case, try a case, and then come up with an appropriate verdict where the truth is said and ultimately justice is served. But yet, that's the concept that is the backdrop of all of this so that we know that this foolishness and folly is taking us into that courtroom and it's talking about individuals who are breaking the law, who are not abiding by the rules of engagement or the rule of law, and certainly they're not operating by the integrity and righteousness of Jesus Christ within their heart. They're not operating by the Word of God and Going back into the days of Israel when they were given the law, they're not operating by the law of God. So that's foolish and folliness, or foolishness and folly when we operate outside of the plan and will of God. When we act counter to His Word, it becomes foolishness and folly within our lives. And it becomes moral degeneracy because we get involved in all kinds of sin. And remember how we just talked about the adulterous woman, again, a euphemism for the briber or the extorter in the courtroom scene. Well, that's a form of moral degeneracy. And uh, we could also say immoral degeneracy as well. Uh, But moral degeneracy just means you're not being moral, okay? Same thing as just the word immoral is all about, okay? So in other words, it's operating in sin. Here we see that it represents primarily in our 
context of perjury or lying inside the courtroom. But it also can include in our daily life slander, gossiping, maligning, backstabbing, whatever the case, where you use your words to run somebody else down. Or you use your words to tell a lie or paint a cloudy picture about that individual so that you impugn their ability to have justice in their life. Or you impugn the character and nature of that individual. And as I've said, as we've gone through this, it's been amazing to just watch the news over the last couple of months and, you know, see what's going on in the political realm. And you see everything but the righteousness, integrity and honesty of God working inside the political realm. I'm sure there are individuals who do operate that way. But time and time again, we see the immoral and the moral degeneracy going on. And as we uh, recently uh, uh, nominated a new Supreme uh, uh, Judge to the court, what did they do? They impugned his character. Liars came forward. They made up things about sexual harassment. They made up lies about his former life, things that happened allegedly, you know, 30, 40 years ago within his life that were totally made up and lies. But what did they do? They impugned his character. And we saw an injustice, and we saw a you know, a a, a bastardization of our justice system in that process. That is not what God wants within a society, certainly not within a Christian society. That is not what we should be having. And people shouldn't be able to just go out and tell lies and spew uh, slanders and malign people up and down to impugn their character so that what? They get their day and they get raised up while the other person gets torn down. Actually, that's what we're going to see when we get to verse 16, that we aren't to use our words in order to better ourselves when we lie and gossip and malign and slander and we go before the court of law in uh, perjury and therefore tell lies in regard to another individual. We're going to see that in the next uh, passage that wraps all of this up. This is what we're not supposed to be doing. We don't do things so that we are better and operate in an immoral way so that we are lifted up. No, we have to operate in honesty and integrity in all realms of life. And whatever happens to us is what happens to us. And as we know from God's word, if we operate in integrity and honesty and truth, God's going to bless us. So why are we trying to go the opposite way? Well, we know the opposite way is Satan's world and Satan's system. And oh, by the way, the God of this world called Satan, he has a form of blessing people too. And many times when we look at individuals who are abusing the law system, abusing the legal system, who are bribing people, extorting people, sometimes we think they're winning out there. And we see them having success. Well, they may be in the world, But believe you me, in the mentality of their soul and in their relationship with God, they are absolute losers and there's distress in their life and God will hold them accountable one way or the other, either either in this life or in the one to come. So this is all talking about (coughs) the foolishness of having verbal sins within the heart of our soul that then gets spoken through our mouths. And it is what we call the sins of the tongue, where we operate in a non-integrity way, where we operate in sin and evil, where we use our words to impugn the reputation of somebody else, to lie, so that ultimately, you know, we are uh, receiving a reward or benefit or for whatever reason, maybe we're just jealous and angry towards that individual. We have hatred towards them. So we're just going to outright lie about them so that ultimately they are torn down while we hopefully are raised up. (coughs) But ultimately, all of these are sins of the tongue that we should not be operating in. As it says in Proverbs 17, 7, it says, Excellent speech is not fitting for a fool. In other words, the fool does not have excellent speech. They have perverse speech, evil speech, sins of the tongue. It says, Much less are lying lips to a prince. And the prince is the one that should be operating in integrity, honesty, and righteousness. We are princes of God because we're all royal ambassadors. We're all royal priests. And we should not have lying lips. They are not part of what we are all about. They are not fitting for us. Therefore, we don't operate in that way. 
So the foolishness of the fool is often characterized as something that is evident to all as well. And this is an interesting aspect of the folly of the fool is that most of the time, and you even see it in society, 99.9% .9 of the time, the liar is found out. They may get away with it for a little while, but eventually the tides turn and the lie becomes evident. And we even saw that again with the example of Judge Kavanaugh. The liars became evident. We knew they were lying. We understood they were lying. There was evidence that they were lying. It all came to the fore. And nobody got off scot-free. And unfortunately, the damage had been done and was almost done to Judge Kavanaugh where he was not allowed, or almost not allowed to sit on the Supreme Court because of falsehoods and lies that were brought against him. But what happened is it all got turned around and we saw the falsehoods and lies of those who were bringing the accusers against him who were part and parcel in the accusations and leading these people, pushing these people with their false a accusations to impugn his character and his nation. God is going to deal with every one of those individuals. Believe it or not, you may not see it, I may not see it, but God is going to deal with those individuals because of the lie that they had inside of the political system, inside the courtroom, inside of a holy and righteous society that otherwise it should be. So again, God will deal with all those individuals one way or the other. Nobody gets away with it. And they may look like they're getting away with it inside of Satan's world because Satan has riches that he can bless with too. But ultimately, God's going to take care of the whole situation and take care of all the individuals. You see, these are the ones <coughs> who have... Uh, and so, in any case, as I've said, these individuals, their folly ultimately is made evident. And typically, the fool is seen to be a liar. You know that they're lying. You understand that they're lying. And the only one that they're really fooling is who? Themselves. And that's what it's all about. And as many Proverbs, I think in the notes I gave you some other passages that talked about the folly of the fool and the lying that they do and how ultimately they're really only fooling themselves. But the rest of the world sees the lie for what it is. And they understand and they recognize that. And their character is the one that is truly impugned. And they're only fooling themselves. And as other Proverbs also tell us, you know, even though they're telling a lie and operating in foolishness, they think they're the wisest individual that's out there. They think they're so smart and so intelligent, but yet everybody sees them for what they are. Now, unfortunately, if there's a gang of people and one of those people or the leader of those people is a liar, guess what? The whole gang is going to be part of the lie. And they're going to support the lie because they all want what that guy is trying to get. Tear somebody else down so that they can be raised up. And the gang is going to look like, oh, we're lifting this person up. But ultimately, God's going to deal with it all. And he's going to uh, take care of those individuals. And those who are not part of the gang that's going along with them, they're going to see them for what they are, being absolute liars and having folly within their life and being foolish in individuals. So we have a couple of verses, Proverbs 12, 23, 13, 16. 13, 16 says, Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool displays folly. You see, the fool displays their folly. It's right out there for everybody to see. And the ones who see it are the ones who are operating in righteousness and integrity, the ones who have Bible doctrine resident in their soul. And when you have the Word of God in your soul, you know that gives you knowledge and wisdom and understanding and discernment. That's what Bible doctrine does to your soul. And when you have that in your soul, you can tell the liar from the truth teller from a mile away. You know when they're lying, you know when they're telling the truth. And you can understand that and see it. And God the Holy Spirit working within you also gives you a conscience so you can understand and cut through the truth, know it's the truth, and cut through the lie knowing that it's a lie. God the Holy Spirit with the Word of God in your soul gives you these things. And so therefore, when you are operating in the integrity and righteousness and holiness of God, having His Word resonant within your soul, you can see the folly of the fool from a mile away because they make it also very evident. It's very evident within their life, and you can understand that. Now, what we also see in this passage is that this folly or foolishness is what? Bound up. 
It's bound up inside of them. That's the Hebrew word kashah. And we've seen this before. And I'm going to contrast that in just a minute for you. But here it means to bind or to tie. But we're seeing another one of our courtroom words. We see the word conspire or conspiracy. That's what this word can also mean within the Hebrew language. And in these passages, in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, Kings, and Amos, as I've given to you on the board, I'm going to show you a couple of those in a minute, they are translated as conspiring. Again, a group of people getting together to do what? Tell a lie. And there's another aspect about this as, as well that's very interesting, is that it's when a group of people come together who have the truth and know the truth, and then withhold it from a situation? Guess what that is, too? A lie. You see, just by withholding the truth, you're telling a lie because you're not allowing the truth to come out, and you're letting everybody else to go along with the lie or deception that is out there, and you're withholding the truth. And in fact, we even saw that with Judge Kavanaugh, with the woman that came forward. People who pushed her forward, they knew the truth. They knew that it, tr it wasn't true information. And ultimately, they knew it was a lie. But what did they do? They withheld certain pieces of information. That, too, is telling a lie. It's the lie of what? Conspiracy. Holding it back. And so we see that uh, wrapped up in this word as well, that foolishness, yes, is bound up in their soul. We're going to see uh, the word heart coming up, leb, in just a minute, the heart of their soul. But ultimately, we can also say the conspiracy is within them. And they are conspiring with other individuals. Maybe as we saw in our last verse, they've taken a bribe, they've been extorted, they've been blackmailed, whatever the case may be. Somehow, some way, they're conspiring. And the conspiracy, or the nature of conspiracy, is bound up within their soul. And that is the foolishness that is coming forward. The conspiracy inside the courtroom, or inside the legal system, or inside your business, or sometimes even inside the church, or inside your family, or inside the neighborhood. Again, Many times people conspire against other individuals with an outright lie or just by withholding certain pieces of information, facts, and truth so that you stumble and fall. That, too, is operating in untruth and unfaithfulness, uh, unrighteousness. Therefore, too, it is caught up in this passage. As Amos chapter 7, verse 10, just to give you a couple of examples, it says, Then Amaziah... The priest of Bethel sent word to Jeroboam, or Jerobo yeah, Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is unable to endure all his words. In other words, he was just spewing out so many lies and falsehoods and conspiracy theories against this guy that, again, it was too much for everybody to handle. And what happens? They all just go along. And that happens sometimes. I, I haven't talked about this recently, but I've said it in, in the past uh, to you before, but it's very apropos with what we're speaking about. And that is the fact that if you tell a lie enough and you tell it over and over and over again, eventually it becomes the truth. Not the real truth, but what people perceive to be the truth. And that's why I always chuckle, too, when you see these uh, political news shows and, you know, you know uh, typically one side versus the other, and you can watch them. And then they give you clips of, oh, this one in this channel said, that one in that channel said, then this person said, then that person said. And it's amazing, like within a day or two days, how every one of them is saying the exact same thing. And it's exactly the same. They're using the same buzzword and the same phrase and the same this or the same that. And it's always to impugn the character of somebody else, typically our president. And they're all saying the same thing. What is that? A conspiracy. It's a lie. It's a falsehood. And it's foolishness and it's folly. And I always kind of, when I watch these things, I kind of laugh at it because you know what it is. You see, it's like, how can they all be saying and using the exact same word to impugn the character and nature or the integrity of another individual? How can they all come up with the same word? They don't. They're all told what to say. Because they're conspiring, conspiring sorry, against an individual. And I always laugh again in the sense that can't these people think for themselves? Can't they really think for themselves? But you know they don't want to. They don't want to. Because it's a gang mentality. 
And when the gang mentality has evil and the gang mentality tells a lie enough, many other people who don't have discernment in life, don't have the Word of God and Bible doctrine, are going to believe the lie and think that it's what? The truth. And they're going to start to hate this one or hate that one or you know, impugn the character of this one or impugn the character and nature of that one. And all of this is what? From who? The father of lies. Who is that? Satan himself. The father of lies. And it's what he did. Remember what Satan did in eternity past? He accused God. And he impugned the character and nature of God. Oh, you're not a just and loving God. How can you throw one of your created beings into the lake of fire? Excuse me. And what did Satan also do in the Garden of Eden? Oh, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... That's not going to be a bad thing. God just doesn't want you to know certain things. But if you eat it, you'll be just like God. And God doesn't want you to know what he knows. You see, he's impugning the character and the nature and the word of God. And the father of lies has been doing it from eternity past. He did it at the beginning of human history. And he continues to propagate it today throughout the world in various ways. And we as individual believers need to fight against that in the mentality of our own soul. And we're going to see at the end of uh, this uh, passage this evening how we fight that. I'm sure you already know through the Word of God and Bible doctrine resident within your soul. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 31, another example. It says, Now someone told David, saying, I don't, I'm not going to pronounce this, this name appropriately, Ahithophel, Ahithophel, is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray, make the counsel of Ahithophel foolishness. Make the counsel of him foolishness. In other words, I know he's conspiring. I know he's coming up with lies. I know he's getting a gang mentality to come up against me. Make it all be what? Foolishness. And what was he really saying there? Same thing I just showed you in these other verses. That foolishness is what? Folly. And it is evident because the fool displays their folly. And it's evident to those who are around them. And they know they're lying. They know they're cheating. They know they're stealing. They know they're conspiring. And they know the Word of God. And they shouldn't enter into those things. So they're not going to conspire with this individual to overthrow the governing powers as they otherwise would like to. And unfortunately, we're getting into a day and age, I'm getting off on politics tonight, I didn't plan on doing this tonight, but in any case, we're in a day and age of our politics where, you know, if we don't put the brakes on real quick, real quick, we're very close from having, you know, absolute anarchy within our political system. Because nobody wants to abide by the law anymore. And we've even seen it in the elections down in Florida and down in Georgia that, you know, the, the losing party doesn't just admit that, hey, I lost the election. And what do we see? Conspiracy and conspiring and cheating and trying to add votes here and add votes there. We don't see the integrity and the righteousness and the truthfulness of the system working, even though it can work in the whole rest of Florida except for two counties. They have a problem. can work in the whole rest of the country, but two counties in Florida can't get their act together. And it's because of the political opposition that is winning when they don't want them to win. So again, they can't just deal in let the chips fall where they may in truth, integrity, and in righteousness. They have to coerce the system. And we are getting into a dangerous place within our country because you see them flexing these muscles a little bit more and a little bit more. And if they lose an election or if somebody gets elected that they don't like, they can't just accept it as a normal uh, you know, a part of society, as part of our system that has been put in place beautifully by our founding forefathers, and they can't accept the outcome on a fair, level way. What do they do? They try to cheat. They try to steal. And they start to conspire. And 
I, I'm going way off on too many politics tonight, but even in uh, what we're seeing already from the new, uh, you know, the new Congress that is, uh, you know, taking effect, that they'll all start in January, they're already talking about, they're not talking about, you know, making our life better and coming up with bills and things that make our life better. What are they talking about? Let's investigate the president. And we're going to investigate him here, we're going to investigate him there, we're going to investigate him there, we're going to and we want to impeach him because they can't accept the election that they lost two years ago. I mean, it's absolutely insane. So again, we see it over and over and over again, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And if our country doesn't put a break on it very soon, and if we don't have more people with honesty and integrity and righteousness and Bible doctrine resident in their soul, if we don't have more of a pivot inside the client nation, well, this is just going to get worse and worse and worse. And before you know it, we're going to be a, a society without law and without rule. And it's going to end up being a dictatorship. Or we're going to have uh, potentially another civil war within this country. I don't know how that's going to play out with the ty type of weaponry we have today. But again, you know, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Okay, I'll get off the pulpit, now, uh, off the uh, soapbox, and get back to the pulpit. All right. So uh, <coughs> this word uh, kasha is used throughout the book of Proverbs. It's used here and uh, three other times. The other three times it's used in the book of Proverbs, it's all about the counter to the conspiracy mentality. It's counter to the foolish mentality where it's talking about binding up the word of God in your soul. And the instruction that is given to the young man, the young woman, to the immature believer, the instruction that is given to them to bind up what? The word of God in your soul. Bind up Bible doctrine. And we see that in Proverbs 3, 3, 6, 21, and 7, 3 as well. And because the fool did not and does not bind up the word of God within their soul, unfortunately, the foolishness of the sins of the tongue are binding up and are bound now to their soul. And so what does that tell us? Again, if we don't want to have foolishness and folly, sin and evil within our lives, we have to have what? The word of God. Because foolishness and folly and sins of the tongue, overt sins, mental attitude sins, all sin comes from what? The old sin nature. The temptation of our old sin nature that is within us. That then our free will volition says, yes, I'm going to do that thing that I've just been tempted to do. I'm going to carry it out. Our old sin nature starts the, the thought, our volition gives into it. And now we're bound to it if we keep on doing that sin over and over and over again. We're bound now to the sin nature. And it's a powerful force in your soul. You all know. Again, even be as believers, with Bible doctrine in your soul, you know that sin nature rears its ugly head all the time. And it's trying to tempt you and tempt you and tempt you. And sometimes you give in. Sometimes we do. Part of life. Part of the weakness of being a human being. And if we let that weakness continue to ride and rule, we're allowing the sin nature to rule our soul, and we're bound up in foolishness. We're bound up in folly. But God gives us an alternative. He gives us His Word. He gives us Bible doctrine. And with the Word of God resident within your soul, you now have what? A new power inside of you. You've got a new force, a new strength. And now you just don't have to succumb to the strength of the old sin nature, which the unbeliever succumbs to every day because that's all they have other than maybe some divine establishment principles in a country like ours that they could abide by. But they're bound to the sin nature. The new believer and the immature believer, those who don't know the Word of God, they too are, get what? Bound to their sin nature. Because they don't, even though they're saved, they don't know the Word of God. And they don't have that strength inside of them yet. And so they're bound to that sin nature, and they have to learn the Word of God. You have to learn Bible doctrine so that that strength and power, that force of God can be a force that rules their life, rules their soul, so that the force of the old sin nature isn't ruling their life and their soul. And the place where all this is bound up is the heart, the heart of the soul. We call that the right lobe. In the Hebrew, it's leb. In the Greek, as you know, it's cardia. It is the right lobe of the soul where we store and retain information. 
and it's that place where we can store and retain the Word of God, or we could store and retain the sin and evil of Satan's cosmic system and allow the temptations of the sin nature to rule our thought process. And that heart talks about the innermost being. So we know we've got a soul, but the Bible also says we have a heart. And it's not talking about the blood pumping organ, but the mentality of our soul, our thinking, our brain, as we would say. And we aren't to be bound up with sin. We are to be bound up with the Word of God, having that resonant within our soul. Folly is part of the mentality of the young, of the immature believer. The old sin nature is in them. The old sin nature rules them because they have not learned yet the other side. As a new believer, now they've been divorced from that sin nature. They've died to the sin nature. But guess what? The sin nature is still alive. They died to it. It didn't die. It never says the sin nature dies in the Bible. It says we die to it. That means it's still alive until we leave planet Earth with its temptation, with its ugliness, with its lust patterns of both moral and immoral degeneracy. It's there, and it tries to lead us. Satan acted as that sin nature to Jesus Christ because he didn't have a sin nature. He was born of the Virgin Mary. No sin nature because that gets passed down through the mail, as you know. But Satan acted as his sin nature and tempted him and tempted him and tempted him. And Jesus was able to overcome it by what? The Word of God. And given in that great example of the three temptations of Jesus, which we're going to probably get into by the time we get around to January. The three temptations. And Jesus Christ said, what? The Word of God says, the Word of God says, the Word of God says. You see a new power and a new force. As we could also say in a slang way, there's a new sheriff in town. There's a new sheriff in town. The old sheriff of the sin nature is no longer. The new sheriff is the word of God, Bible doctrine within your soul. Because we are reminded from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, which we've recently studied, it says, Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Again, as an unbeliever, that's how we function and operate, by the sin nature, operating in the folly and the foolishness that comes from the sin nature. But as believers, we can learn the Word of God. We can learn to counter the force of the sin nature. We can learn the, what the Word of God says about every situation in life and apply it. And it may not be exactly specific, but the Bible is general enough where you can apply it to every specific aspect of your life to make a good decision for your society, to make a good decision for God in your walk with Him. And so we learn the Word of God so that we can counter the force and negate the negative influence of the sin nature that is within us, uh, uh, within our body, that tries to be in control of our soul. And the negation is seen in the second half of this verse where it says the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. And again, this goes back to a general principle of a parent disciplining their children so that they learn right from wrong and how it's good to spank a child. I'm going to show you some interesting aspects of that in just a minute. But it's good to spank a child and punish them so that they learn. And they learn right from wrong, and they learn not what to do, and they learn what they should be doing within life and within society. But what we're seeing from this, we're talking about the courtroom, we're talking about the perjurer, we're talking about the conspiracy, foolish liar that is inside the courtroom. We're talking about the making up of falsehoods, the lying that's in the street, the fantasies of why I shouldn't do this or why I shouldn't do that to contribute to society. So we see that the way we learn about those things, as it says, the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. That rod of discipline is the word Shabbat. We've seen that already in the book of Proverbs. I've given that to you more in your notes as well. But it basically, it does mean a rod or a stick that you could spank somebody with, okay? My mother used to use this wooden spoon, okay? And uh, did I, tell you, I told you a story. Oh, mostly 
A lot of you from my family, so you know the story. But when I was probably about, I don't know, eight or nine, maybe ten years old, I did something wrong, and my mother said, get up in your room. We're going to be up there and spank you in five minutes. So I was like, no, don't spank me, don't spank me. So I ran up to my bedroom, and I said, I'm going to outsmart her. I know what to do. And so I went into my drawer, my top drawer, where you keep all your underwear and stuff, and I put on every pair of underwear and long johns that I had so that when my mother came up to spank me, it wouldn't hurt that bad. I had all this padding now of 20 layers of underwear on my butt. And it wouldn't hurt. So I sat up there. I said, I'm going to outsmart her. I'm going to fool whatever. She never came up. <laughs> she never came up. And so again, she outsmarted me. <laughs> and just by going through that whole process of knowing that the spoon could be there, because she spanked us with the spoon before, and whatnot. I think my brother, she had to use a metal spoon because the wooden one used to break on him all the time. And, you know, he wouldn't cry with a wooden, so she had to take out the metal one. But in any case, you know, that whole process of just the fear of the spoon, the spear of the rod, or the, the, the fear of the rod, led me to do a foolish act of putting on all that underwear. But it also made me dwell on what? The wrong that I did and the discipline that can come along with it. So again, Shabbat is that word for rod. It can mean that. But remember, we also saw this earlier in the, in, in the chapter. And it could also mean a scepter. Again, a king's scepter. This word Shabbat is used for that. So it talks about a position of authority or an object of authority. So the rod of discipline, we're talking about the authoritative nature of what? Discipline, and that's the word musa. And discipline can be, you know, the punitive discipline, but it all can be also mean, you know, learning something as well. Learning a discipline, as they call it in school. Or we can call it in the church as well as we teach the discipline of God, the theology of God. So again, this is talking about, yes, yeah, okay to spank a child, and he'll learn from that. That's the, you know, the, the, the black and white uh, object lesson that we take away. But the context of the courtroom and what we're seeing here with the counter of the negation of the Word of God is the authority of learning God's Word, Bible doctrine, the rod of discipline. And the Word of God, Bible doctrine, should be authoritative in your life. And we as individuals who are mature believers, certainly the pastor teacher should be a mature believer with knowledge of the Word of God. He should be teaching the Word with an authoritative sense, having authority to teach that Word so that people can learn that Word. In other words, they're being disciplined. Not in a punitive way, but they're learning a discipline. And they're learning the Word of God. So again, it speaks of the power and authority of training our fellow members of the human race. And all of us have that responsibility. We're all to be teachers, witnesses of the Word. And as we grow to spiritual maturity, we should take that knowledge of Bible doctrine and teach it to the unbeliever and also to the new believer, the immature. That's what's in view here, teaching the Word of God. Now, I, I didn't have this in your notes, but from previous lessons, you also know that that means, you know, sometimes you can reprove and rebuke people, okay? You can call a lie for a lie. You can, you know, if they're uh, saying things counter to the Word of God and maybe impugning or uh, impugning the, uh, the uh, character, nature, and integrity of God, you can reprove and rebuke them. If they say that they're a believer and they're living a lifestyle of sin and it's being uh, made evident to many people around them, you can reprove and rebuke them with the Word of God. In the church, the way God had designed the local assembly, there should be divine discipline within the church. That is brought on by the pastor and the deacons of the church. If there are individuals who are operating in sin and they continue in that sin consistently, book of Timothy and Titus, Paul gives instruction how the church should be disciplining its congregation, if necessary. I should say members of the congregation, if necessary. So again, all of that can be in view. But what we're really doing with all of that, just as God disciplines us, sometimes, yes, it may feel punitive, but it's what? A teaching aid. It's about learning. It's about growing. It's about knowing right from wrong, righteousness from unrighteousness or unrighteousness, knowing holiness for unholiness. 
As Proverbs 1, 2 says, no wisdom and instruction to discern the sayings of understanding. In other words, learn this so that you have knowledge and you can have discernment when you walk out in life. As Proverbs 23, 12 says, apply your heart to discipline and your ears to words of knowledge. That's what we're to be doing. Again, learning the word of God, applying that within our life. As Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom and instruction and understanding. You see, discipline is much more than just a punitive spanking on the butt. It's a teaching tool. It's a teaching aid. And again, parents to children, that can be in view and uh, should give instruction. But more importantly, it's learning right from wrong. It's learning integrity, honesty, justice, righteousness. It's learning the Word of God. And then being able to apply that in life. And so the only antidote uh, or corrective to sin in our life is what? Discipline. Sometimes divine discipline by God to spank, you know, give us that, you know, parent spanking the child type of thing. But more importantly, learning the Word of God. Disciplining yourself to learn the Word of God. Have discipline to learn discipline. And to learn a discipline. You can use it in all three ways, okay? So again, that's the antidote. Having discipline within our lives, learning the Word of God, Bible doctrine, so that ultimately we can counter the effects of the sin nature. We can account the, uh, the effects of uh, getting led easily into sin. And in this case, in the courtroom, counter the effects of getting involved in a conspiracy, getting involved in lying in the courtroom, taking a bribe, not telling the truth, not serving as we should. Again, it gives us the antidote. It gives us what to do, and it tells us what not to do as well. And when we are able to learn it and apply it, those who are teaching it should always be doing it out of what love? Impersonal, unconditional love, as we've also talked about, motivational, agape, virtue love. You see, the parent disciplining the children, they should be doing that in love, not anger and hatred and getting the child back. shouldn't have that mentality towards the child. They're just a child with sin. As you bring discipline to the unbeliever or to the immature believer, you don't do it in anger and hatred and bitterness. You do it in love as a teaching aid. And when I say bring discipline the teaching of the word, the witnessing of the word, the evangelizing of the word. And if you need to reprove and rebuke, you do it gently with the immature. And again, Paul talked about this in the book of Corinthians. You do it gently with the immature, but for those who know and who are more mature, you can come down with a, you know, a, a two-by-four club. Okay? <laughs> and it says, whack them over the head because they'll know better. And they'll learn from it because they know the immature, the unbeliever, they don't know. So you've got to be gentle with them and kind. So just as the parent has to look at every child, and, you know, you may have two or three or four kids in your family, children in your family, they're all different. And the sin or the, the wrong that they do is always different too. And you have to judge each situation unto itself and then administer the discipline in love individually and what is necessary for that situation and it's interesting that uh, also saw in the news last night that uh, there's a bill coming forward to our president that they're uh, I guess he signed it yesterday they're uh, changing um, some of the laws in regard to uh, first-time offense or minor offenses where people who are getting who have gotten involved in drug abuse or alcohol abuse and maybe have committed some minor crime or just possessed it. These people, you know, based on the law that, uh, that was written up in 1994, some of them were getting thrown away for three to ten years for having that possession when they really didn't hurt anybody. And so one example of a kid made a joke about selling, you know, fake cocaine to a police officer, went away for three years in maximum prison because it was the mandatory minimum sentence. And so they're changing that so that the judge can have discernment. And the judge can look at each case and say, well, this isn't egregious. 
you know, they haven't hurt anybody. They've hurt themselves. So I'm going to act lightly with this individual. There still is a penalty that goes with it. But maybe the next person, maybe they hurt somebody, took property, or maybe even hurt their life somehow, some way. Something more severe needs to happen to that person. And so now our judges will have the ability to have discernment in each situation. Guess what that is? Biblical. Biblical. And that's how we should be operating, too, in our discipline towards our fellow brethren and also towards our children. Because we ought to be doing it in love so that ultimately we have the concern of that individual in our heart. And we want the best for them. We don't want to just punish them. That should never be the object of discipline, not to just punish. Okay, It's a teaching aid. And we should always want to be teaching and training. And if punishment is necessary in that training, then apply it. But many times training is just training and punishment is not necessary whatsoever, even when a wrong was done. Again, my mother threatened me with a punishment. She never came up to punish me. But it was enough. And I still remember today, and I just told you that, what was that, probably 50 years ago that happened. Okay, Still fresh in my mind today. A teaching aid. She's probably at home laughing as she's listening to this online tonight. All right, but in any case, all children, again, are different. And the situation is different. Their contention and rebellion is different. So we need to treat them differently so that we have their best interest at heart and let the punishment fit the crime, as we like to say, as well. In Proverbs 25, 12, it says, Like an earring of gold, an ornament of fine gold, is the wise reprover to a listening ear. That's how we should operate. Refined. An ornament. And that's the wise reprover to those who listen to the discipline that we're giving. Those who hate God's discipline ignore His commandments. They stray far from it. We understand that from the various passages and scriptures. Let me kind of go through a couple of these quick. It says, Proverbs in uh, one seven. it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You see, we've seen throughout the book of Proverbs that a fool operates foolishly. And the reason that they're a fool is because they're rejecting God's word. But at the same time, it tells us, Discipline the fool. Give them further instruction. Sometimes it kind of gives the context of it's a waste of time because they're just going to continue in their folly. But it also reminds us never give up on people and continue to work in their life. So again, if you have friends who you've witnessed the gospel of Jesus Christ to and they've never accepted, don't give up. Don't just say, oh, forget it. Because you never know what's going to trigger their acceptance of Jesus Christ. It could be 10 years, 20 years from now. You never know. In Proverbs 19.27, Cease listening, my son, to discipline, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. In 16.22, Understanding is a fountain of life to one who has it, but the discipline of fools is folly. And that's the one where sometimes it's a waste of time. If they continue in their foolishness, disciplining them becomes folly because they don't learn from it. But yet we don't give up, and we continue to try to work in their life. In Proverbs 15, 5, the fool rejects his father's discipline, but he who regards reproof is sensible. And that goes for you and I, again, because, you know, God is working in our life. And sometimes he's doing things that is divine discipline, and sometimes we don't even think, oh, just, it's just what happens today. Well, wait a minute, no, that's God working in your life. God's trying to teach you something. God's trying to, you know, bring you to a better place. And so don't disregard the, pro the reproof of God. And don't just fluff everything off as, oh, that's just life. No, think about it. Understand it. Discern it. Maybe God's trying to give you a message so that you can have better walk with him and a better life here and also in the eternal state. In Proverbs 13, 24, he who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him. 
And I wanted to share these two things with you, and then uh, we'll wrap up for tonight. Uh, remember, you know, our English proverb, spare the rod, spoil the child. That comes from these proverbs, okay, in comparing all of those. Okay, Proverbs 10, 13, 22, Oz, 23, and also 29. Spare the rod, spoil the child. We get that, okay? Kind of comes out of the pages. But in the ancient Egyptian world, they had two other proverbs that I thought was interesting. And they had a proverb, one that says, boys have ears on their backsides. <laughs> in other words, you spank their butt, they're going to learn. You see, the ears were to hear. You have the learning gate. You have the eye gate that you learn. You've got the ear gate that you can learn from. You can see and learn or you can hear and learn. Boys have ears on their backsides. In other words, when they get disciplined, again, they can learn from it. And then they also had one that says, he who is not flogged is not educated. Okay, he's not educated. And if you want to be the Dr. Spock, again, not the Star Trek Spock, but this other guy that wrote these books back in the 70s, oh, you can't spank a child, oh, you'll destroy their lives. You know, the guy was smoking dope, as you know, okay? But in any case, he didn't know what he was talking about. And it was counted to the Word of God. Because, again, he who is not flogged is not educated. And what we find, and I'll leave you with this, and there's a lot more things you can read in your notes uh, that you can uh, read and study on your own time. But when we do have discipline in the life, in our life, or in the life of a fool, again, that, dis that, that foolishness is what? Removed far from him. And so the lying, the sins of the tongue, in all categories of sin can be far removed from the mentality of our soul when we have the Word of God, Bible doctrine, resonant within our soul. And we apply that to our lives on a consistent basis. So again, when we talk about discipline, sometimes, yes, physical, punitive discipline will do this, but also the discipline of God's Word. And when you have God's Word in your soul, you've got the power, the source, the resource, the strength. You've got everything that you need to do what? Overcome your old sin nature. You also have the filling of God the Holy Spirit to do what? Overcome the old sin nature. So you don't have to give in to it. You don't have to succumb to it. And you don't have to be a fool by it, getting led into all the foolishness and folly that it otherwise brings. But with the Word of God, you have the power and the strength of God inside of you. And you know the power of God is powerful enough to overcome all things, to move mountains as we continue to apply faith in His Word. All right, so we'll close there. And uh, again, you can read the rest of the notes on your own time, but uh, we'll pick it up in verse 16 and finish this collection called Collection 2 on Sunday morning. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word that instructs us and disciplines us, teaches us right from wrong and how to function and operate. We thank you for giving us the strength and power to overcome Satan, sin, and his cosmic system. And we ask that this word be more mighty in our lives each and every day by the filling of your spirit and the teaching of your spirit so that we glorify you and operate in righteousness and integrity, not only before you, but within our society and amongst one another, serving each other each and every day. So, Father, we thank you for this time. In Christ's precious name, we ask for travel blessings home. Amen.